to the God. Let's clap your hands for Jesus, everybody. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Be seated if you can. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you. Give these musicians a hand. They're so talented. They make our job easy. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Ferguson, Brother Sherrod, and Brother Yelton. Give them another hand. Challenge them. We want you uh, to govern yourself accordingly, and I want to take a moment.
choir this one time. Another snap to our feet. chapter 1, verse number 3, is our key verse. You're about to say amen. The Bible reads, Blessed be the God Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. From those words and that verse, I want you to look at your neighbor and say, live in the hope, live in the hope. of the resurrection. Of the resurrection. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Live in the hope of of the resurrection. The living hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ inspires greatness within the body of Christ. Hope is defined as inspiring confidence, a feeling of expectation or desire for a certain thing to happen. Many people believe that we are living in hopeless times even in the midst of society where there's almost a church on every corner. We seem to be living in a world where people are getting a PhD and giving up. Quitting has become an easy thing to do in the times that we're in. We have a philosophy that is a philosophy of hopelessness and we're trying to figure out why it has become so easy for people to throw in the towel, to walk out, or to give up, give in, or give out. And we are living in times where many people believe that we are in hopeless times. This seems like the harder we try to get people to do right, they just won't do. Seems like the more that we try to get folks to say the right things and think the right things, they tend to do the exact opposite. It seems like the more we try, the harder it is to get any type of positive results. That's what it seems like. Parents are quitting on their children. Employees are quitting on their employers. Husbands and wives are quitting on their marriages. Seems like everybody is so easily majoring and giving up. But true Christians must endure the trials of life through the living hope of the resurrection. This is our vision theme this year, the living hope of the resurrection. While we all will and may be continuously dealing with the trials and tribulations of life, God has given us a promise of the hope of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So what that means is, is that God is not dead. Even while there are people walking out on you right now, God is still alive. Even though while people are giving up on uh, their families and their marriages and everything that people thought that they ever stood for, Jesus is still at the right hand of God. So we have hope. It was Edward Mott that wrote in 1834 that famous hymn, The Solid Rock. And it says, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. It goes on to say, on Christ, the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Many people do not know that when Edward Mott was growing up as a little boy before he became a Christian and a preacher, he grew up in the home of parents that did not believe in. God. 
He grew up in a home where his father and mother ran a liquor store. They ran a bar where they would often leave him stranded as a neglected child in the home to fend for himself while they were drinking and partying with their friends. It was some several years later at the age of 54 years old that he became a pastor. And after pastoring a church for 21 years, in the midst of a day's meditation, with God, he took a moment to write down the words of this famous hymn, and he thought back to his experience as a child that it could not have been his mom and daddy that were keeping him because they were at a bar drinking uh, a beer and liquor. It had to have been God that was keeping him all the while, and that's why he knew that it was on Christ, the solid rock he stands. The vision this year calls for us to live in the hope of the resurrection. The living hope of the resurrection inspires us to look beyond negative circumstances. Looking beyond negative circumstances does not mean to ignore or avoid negative circumstances. We're going to know that things will come our way. We're going to know that trials and tribulations will come because Jesus said in this life we have trials and tribulations. We ought to acknowledge the promise of Scripture. While trials may be on every hand, we also know that Jesus said, with God, all things are possible. Amen. We thank God for being a God of possibilities. We thank God for showing us a new year. We thank God for carrying us through some dark and painful days last year. A God who was able to wipe our tears for us when the Kleenex boxes had ran out. We thank God for being a protector, a provider, and a keeper in the midst of difficult times. But we are also called to be uh, faithful to God by walking by faith and not by sight. We're living in times where people believe that there's no hope. But Mount Emmanuel is called to be that church that is like a city upon a hill, a light shining in the darkness, a place of hope where it seems there is no hope. And there's a story told about a preacher who was scheduled to preach at a church conference and was given a time limit of 20 minutes to preach his sermon. The other preachers from his association were sitting behind him in the choir section. They were amening him and giving him more support as he preached along in his sermon. The preacher preached his 20 minutes and continued to preach on beyond his time limit. He preached for 30 minutes and then for 40 minutes and then he preached on for an hour. He even continued for one hour and ten minutes. And finally, a brother sitting on the front row took a song book, a, a hymn book, and threw it at the preacher. And as the preacher ducked, and he still kept going in his message, the preacher, as he ducked, the book flew over his head and hit another man that was sitting behind him. And, and as the man in the section was going down, you could hear him say, hit him again, I can still hear him preaching. Our commitment to share the gospel must be inspired by the spirit of hope and not by the spirit of hopelessness. Our trust in the soul saving power of the gospel cannot be limited to the level of hatred, hopelessness, and hostility we face. Our hope is in the living power of the resurrection. Look to neighbor and say, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Hallelujah. My brothers and sisters, we have the living hope of the resurrection as our guide this year. You are in a storm, coming out of a storm, headed to a storm. But because Jesus is still alive and well, you can make it through the storm. Here we are today in our text. Peter wrote this first epistle to praise God for new life and hope in Jesus Christ. Peter knew firsthand what it, what it meant to deny Jesus. Peter knew what it meant firsthand to walk away from Jesus. 
Peter had denied him three times. And while one day after Jesus had risen from the grave, Peter was out there on the sea. He was fishing again. And some of us have gone back to fishing again for the fish that we can eat and not for the fish that we can save. And Peter was out there, and he swam a hundred yards when Jesus called out to him, and, and he forgave him, and he restored him. And, and Peter can stand to say that if there is hope for me when I was lost, there can be hope for you if you have gone astray. Peter blessed and thank God for his new life and the hope that he has been given through a restored relationship with Christ. God has chosen us as his children. They have been born again, this church, because they now have a new family. They have been born into their physical, natural family, and now they have been born again into their heavenly and holy family. He says, be ye holy, for God is holy. He says that you are a chosen generation. You are a royal priesthood. God the Father raised Jesus from death to give everlasting life to all who believe. This is a life of faith because the church could not actually see Jesus. And some of you are dealing with problems right now, and you're just looking for some evidence. And you're looking for God to give you a sign that, that he has heard your prayer. And I'm a living witness that even though you can't see Jesus in the flesh, you can see him in the spirit. Because he's right now interceding on your behalf that the storm is only temporary. And I do have good news for you today that in 2018, but if you will discover that your problems have an expiration date, there's a date that you are in that's called due season. And that season is not winter, spring, summer, fall. It's a reminder of the scripture that says, in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So everything you were praying for in 2017, everything you were crying for in 2017 is not in vain because your labor is not in vain in the Lord. This is a life of faith, people, Peter is reminding the church, because even though you cannot physically see Jesus, you can always look forward to the salvation, your complete deliverance, your spiritual cleansing, and your future healing. Peter acknowledged that the earthly life was difficult, and its wealth would not always last. He wanted the church to know that there was pain for taking a stand for Jesus, and perhaps even at times we will be persecuted and scorned for our relationship with Jesus. But he concludes by reminding them that but with the eyes of faith, they can see beyond these temporary and short-term sufferings. He reminded them that they can have hope and they can live in a joyful hope. And that is my prayer for our church. That is my prayer for every Christian around the world that in spite of the corrupt governments and in spite of back fighting and hatred uh, and even uh, sin that seems to be so pervasive in our land we can live with the joyful hope uh, in the power of the resurrection somebody said to me how do we live with the joyful hope the first lesson is you got to trust God for new life touch neighbor say trust God for new life the new life that I'm talking about is found in Jesus Christ blessed be the God our Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope for, through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. That word hope comes from the word elpis, which means trust, expectation, and confidence. Many of us uh, came in here today and sat down in pews without wondering if they had the strength, the power, and the ability to hold us up. We base it on previous confidence. We base it on previous expectations. We base it on previous trust. And this is what Peter is saying to us, that trust is an action and not an idea. Trust is something that you do and not something that you just think about. Trust is something that you live by celebrating what God has already done. How many of you know God is a keeper? The reason I know that he's a keeper because I did not watch over myself last night as I slept. 
God watched over me all night long, and he is worthy of trust. He's worthy of confidence. He is a keeper, and he shall never sleep nor slumber. Peter knew that because he could trust God that while he was out on the ship, out on the water, the other 11 disciples were telling him to stay in, but the Holy Spirit was telling him to step out. And that's what you got to do in 2018 on another the level that you didn't do in 2017, some of us have got to step out on faith. you got to trust God on another level. God is used to you complaining. God is used to you crying. God is used to you telling him all about your troubles. But God is asking you in 2018, where is the hope? Where is the trust? Where is the expectation? And in 2018, I'm looking for God to do some things this year that he has never, ever done before. Peter says we have a new life. We have the blessed God of our Father, Jesus Christ. We have to trust him even when we can't trace him. We have to we have confidence in him and expect him to step in even when we doesn't look like we should step out. And this year is going to be different for some of you because you're going to do things this year that you've never done before. You're going to, to see places that you've never seen before. You're going to, to experience God on a level that you had never thought you would see before. Thank God for a new life. While others are dead and gone last year, they are gone on to be with the Lord. God still has kept us here, and he's wanting us to trust him for a new life. Secondly, after we trust him for a new life, we have to thank God for new gifts. Thank God for new gifts. How do we know this? The scripture says, and into an inheritance that is imperishable. That word inheritance comes from the word kleronomia, which means heritage. It means a gift. It literally means the promised land. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, God keeps his promises. A friend of mine was telling me that her insurance agency was challenged by a mother that came in uh, during the Christmas holidays, and she wanted to cancel all of her life insurance policies on everybody in the family so that she could buy her children Christmas gifts. My brothers and sisters, many of us are struggling to hold true to the things that we know are real simply by trying to fit in and please the status quo of society. God wants us to know that our inheritance and our heritage is not in popularity of the culture. It's not in the commercials that we see on television. It's not even on the covers of the magazine. While scientists said man has come from monkey. Uh, the Bible tells us that we were created by God. Your inheritance is not in what uh, science says about you. Your inheritance is in who God says you are. We wonder why people are so confused and so hopeless in a society where people are so quick to believe everything they see on television or every ad that flashes on their tablet or their telephone. And we fail to pause and close down all the noise and seek to hear from God who has given us an inheritance. My brothers and sisters, whatever you need, God's got it. Whatever you want, God has it in store for you. He's wanting to see if you actually have an attitude of gratitude, if you're actually thankful for what he's already given you right now. Let me give you a practical survey. If you are wanting a new car, don't wash the one you got right now. You don't need it. If you are looking for a new husband, a new wife, and you ain't treating the one you got right right now, look at your neighbor and say, you don't need it. If you are looking for new shoes, new clothes, and new things that are looking good on the outside but are no reflection for who you really are on the inside, God wants you to receive your spiritual inheritance before you receive your physical inheritance. And a true Christian, a true person of hope ought to have a heart of thanksgiving. 
My brother and sister David saying, if I had a thousand tongues, I couldn't thank God enough. And if any of you, while you were complaining all through 2017, God still blessed you anyway. While you were crying all through 2017, God still extended favor and mercy unto you. While you were talking bad about people on Facebook and Snapchat and Twitter, he still blessed you anyway. You got to thank God for the new gifts. Every day I wake up, I say, God, I didn't know you were going to bless me like that. And here we are today, being reminded of our vision thing that we have the living hope of the resurrection going before us. I'm not saying that there are going to be sunshine every day. I'm not saying that, that all the clouds have rolled away. But what I am saying is, with Jesus on our side, things will work out fine. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, we're going to make it. Here we are today trusting God for new life, thanking God for new gifts. But thirdly and finally, we got to try God for new mercies. Just name say, try God. Many of us have heard about him, but we've never tried. And I'm so glad. I remember the old preacher said, I tried him and I know that he's all right. Verse number five tells us that who are being protected. Song the choir just finished saying is saying that he is a protector. Who are being protected, that word comes to the word guarded, which is for real, which means to keep watch. It means to protect offensively and defensively. My brothers and sisters, when you pray, when you pray a prayer of faith, the Bible dispatches promises unto you that you can send angels to any zip code or territory to where the enemy is stirring up trouble. I'm so glad that I serve a God that, that only watches over me and defends me from the hand of the enemy. He also gives me angels that I can dispatch at the command of his Holy Spirit to go after any trouble that is coming my way. So if I were you, I would be worried about to the problems that are in your way. I'll be worried about the people that are trying to bring you problems because you got a God that is going to watch over you, protect you, and keep you. My brothers and sisters, the church was being persecuted. Not just because they were followers of Christ, but because the things that they were saying that Jesus could do, uh, while he already had been crucified and ascended uh, into heaven, uh, was still being done. Uh, that was a problem for uh, the practical-minded people of the day because they wanted to know how could a man who once was dead uh, and now has risen into heaven still could be performing miracles right here on earth. Uh, and the answer to that question is, is the power of the resurrection. People are getting mad because the church was still raising up dead folks. People were getting mad because people were still healing in the name of Jesus. People were getting upset because Peter was being broken out of jail by angelic beings. And it's still gone right now today that's stirring up trouble in the minds of misguided people because he's still raising up dead folks. He's still paying bills. He's still getting people who are lame to walk again. He's still blessing each and every day and all you got to do is try my brothers and sisters that's why the old folks had it right they say I tried him and I know that he's all right my brothers and sisters, he is a protector in the time of a storm. And if you have anything to do new this year, you ought to tell your testimony. You ought not tell about the God that you heard about. You ought to tell about the God that you know for yourself. That's what you got to do. You got to try for yourself. It's just like going to the doctor and the doctor writes a, a prescription. He could write it to Walgreens on Augusta Street. He could write it to CBS on Lawrence Road. He could write the, the prescription to any location to where you want to pick it up. He could say, take three of these and come back and see me in about two weeks. And then you can fulfill the prescription. You can go by Walgreens and pick it up and set that bottle on the shelf and never take it. Go back to the doctor two weeks later and say, Doc, I'm still having pain. And the doctor's going to say to you one thing that I'm going to ask you to. Did you take your prescription? 
And my question to you about Emmanuel in 2018, when you're going through the trials of life, when you're having your ups and downs, when you're feeling your aches and pains, are you taking your prescription? My brothers and sisters, Peter reminds us that the new birth comes from God and is based upon his mercy. Peter reminds us that the new birth ushers in believers into a new life which is ushered under the figures of hope, inheritance, and salvation. Peter reminds us that hope is made possible by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Peter reminds us that hope is the anticipation and sharing in the glory of God. Peter reminds us that the inheritance is described as something that death cannot destroy, evil cannot pollute, and time cannot cause to wither away. He reminds us that salvation is the complete deliverance which will be ours in glory. If you hear what I'm saying today, you ought to look at your neighbor and say, Neighbor, I have an inheritance. My brothers and sisters, I thank God for Bashan Mitchell. And I also thank God for that other man that sang the song that he said, I got evidence. I got confidence. I'm a conqueror. I know that I win. The songwriter said, I know who I am. He said, my name is Victory. And that's what you ought to be able to do in 2018. If you felt like a loser last year, in the hope of the resurrection, you ought to feel like a winner this year. And we already have been born again. And we all have been guarded by God's grace and his mercy. But Peter says that there is another fullness of time that is coming. It's a manifestation of a time yet to come. And my brothers and sisters, the songwriter said it this way. When all God's children get together, he says, what a time, what a time. I'm so glad that I'm not by myself and praising God in the midst of trials. I'm so glad that I'm not giving up by myself because God never gave up on me. I'm so glad that I'm here today with somebody here that knows even with pain in their body that there's hope in the power of the resurrection. I got to get out of here, but I got to tell you one more story. In order to know who you are, you got to know who you are. And there's a little girl who one day, she came and asked her mother, she said, Mother, where do people come from? And her mother said, God made Adam Eve. He made Adam from the dust. He put Adam to sleep one night. And he took Eve from his rear. They had children one day. And they're all the mothers and fathers of humanity. A few minutes later, the little girl went and asked her father. She said, Daddy, where do people come from? My daddy said, billions of years ago, huh? a lot of things evolved from monkeys, huh? and an ape-like creature huh? found in the unknown basin, huh? evolved into huh? a upright walking creature, huh? and that's how humans came to be. Huh? The little girl was confused. She went back to her mother and said, huh? she said, Mama, huh? you said huh? that people were created by God. Huh? You said huh? that God created Adam from the dust. You said that God put him to sleep, and you said that he took Eve from his rib. But when I asked Daddy, he told me something different. He told me that man came from monkey, and that's how we became today. How am I supposed to know which one of you was right? Mama stood up. She had a smile on her face. She said, well, you know, honey, we're both right. I was telling you about my side of the family, and your daddy was telling you about his side of the family. And that's what's wrong with some of us. We so busy, this is the monkeys. We don't know what God has given us. And he's so good. He didn't give me no monkey. The Lord brought a heel called Calvary. Because if you watch monkeys, they like to hop around. They like to swing on things. One day they believe one thing, and the next day they believe.
need something else. But I got good news for you. The God I serve, he ain't no monkey. He was a man, but he should not lie. He's not a man, but he should not repent. And while he was on a Calvary hill, he hung his head. For me, he died. They thought they had him. He went in the grave. Thank you. 